Ladies and gentlemen, my talk is called Aspects of Sufism. <clears throat> and I have spoken, I will probably repeat many things I have said before, but so <clears throat> What I would like to begin with is uh, to tell you that I won't speak, <clears throat> for those of you who are Muslim, I won't speak of the Holy Quran when I speak. I will speak simply of the Quran as we do in English. We don't say normally the Holy Bible, uh, Christians, we say it the Bible. So I will say the Holy Quran. And when I speak of the Prophet <coughs> uh, I will say now uh, uh, for the whole talk because uh, in English we don't interrupt uh, talks with the, with the Arabic formula and that so he will excuse me and I feel that he will excuse me also if I don't repeat every time these <coughs> words. Now, the Quran, and this is not generally known, uh, unfortunately most Muslims today at any rate are very ignorant of the Quran. They only know certain verses which they use, many people, and this is in, in increasing. And they uh, are unaware of many passages in the Quran. Uh, now, the Quran says very clearly to every people we have sent a messenger. Some of them we have mentioned, others we have not mentioned. Now, uh, people, to every people, the word people, may mean uh, a whole continent, or it may be a much smaller area. But if we look at the world as it is today, uh, we see immediately what religions have been sent by God. That is, we see what are the great religions of the world. There's no need, in fact, for me to mention their names. We see also the remains of older religions, which also clearly came from God, but when they have the, they had to be replaced by other religions because what God gives to man man eventually destroys the, the religions of uh, uh, India that is Hinduism uh, of Greece and Rome were originally uh, sister religions. They all clearly came from God. Only one of those three religions remains today, that is Hinduism. The religions of Greece and Rome were eventually destroyed and corrupted by man. They had to be replaced by uh, other religions and um, but Hinduism remains it has retained its its uh, truth and now there is a passage in the Quran which is not generally known and uh, it is uh, it is a Medina verse, it is not an early verse in the Quran. Uh, some people like to think 
but it is it has been uh, uh, abrogated because it doesn't fit in with the uh, modern Islamic ideas but uh, nonetheless it is clearly not the, the Quran is just taking the advantage it's a later revelation revealed in Medina towards the end of the Prophet's life and the Quran here takes the advantage of speaking not only to Muslims but to the whole world and the words are this for each of you we have made a law and traced out a path and if God had wished he would have made you one people uh, the, 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 the next verse is a little elliptical but we did what we did in order that we might put you to a test that is a fair test in what we are given you that is if we are given only one religion it would not have been a fair test because that religion would have suited some people better than others so we gave you many religions and uh, uh, as to the differences between religions the Quran goes on to say vie with each other that is you members of different religions vie with each other in good works unto him that is to us the Quran often speaks God speaks in the first person and then in the third person sometimes of himself unto him you will be brought back and he will explain to you the differences between you that is we do not need to worry, the vast majority of people don't need to worry about the differences between different religions because God promises that when we return to him he will explain to us the differences between Islam, Christianity, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism and so on. I was once asked a question an intelligent question by uh, uh, a Muslim lady did I think that the Buddha was one of these messengers whom God sent to uh, to a people and who uh, one is is the Buddha one of those who are not mentioned in the Quran and I said without a doubt yes because the Buddha founded a world religion which has remained for over 2,000 years and which is still alive and only a divine messenger could do that God would not have allowed any pseudo messenger pseudo prophet to found a world religion like that this is just by the way but let us illustrate what this verse of the Quran uh, tells us that by a large circle and let the different religions uh, that is the different sent by different messengers to all the people on earth let them be represented by a point on the circumference of the circle now from every point there is a radius moving to the center the center is God himself the answer to the question what is Sufism is that Sufism is the radius which leads from the point on the circumference which is Islam to the center that is precisely what Sufism is and from every uh, point on the circumference 
there is, I repeat, a radius leading to the center. And as they approach the center, the radii become nearer and nearer to each other. On the circumference, there is some distance between uh, the point where Christianity starts, the point where Islam starts, the point where Hinduism starts, the point where Judaism starts. But as the radii approach, and the, each radius represents the inner aspect, what sometimes called the mystical aspect, the mysticism in question of its religion and as they approach the center uh, they become the radii become nearer and nearer to each other that is every religion every religion uh, in its mysticism is near, relatively near to the other religions and that is why in India uh, the Sufis uh, throughout the centuries have lived in harmonious good relationship with their Hindu equivalents in many parts of India uh, Sufi orders and the corresponding Hindu orders have been in communication with each other. It has even happened that in the past that Hindus, when their uh, guru died, have noticed that the, the Muslim sheikh who is guiding the Sufis in a nearby village is more spiritual than their own guru's successor and it has been known that they have come to the sheikh that the Sufi sheikh and asked him to be their guide while remaining Hindus and the Sufi sheikh has agreed to do that and the opposite has happened that Sufis have sometimes come under the guidance of a Hindu guru when they felt that he was the most spiritual man uh, uh, they could make contact with. Now, in the beginning, Sufism had no name. It is often said that Sufism had no name. Uh, Ibn Khaldun, the historian, the famous uh, uh, Muslim historian in the Middle Ages uh, said that at first spirituality was too general to have a special name but when worldliness spread then a special name was necessary and the uh, inner aspect of Islam came to be called Sufism. But already in the 10th century uh, many Sufis felt that Sufism itself was degenerating to a certain extent. It is not the same as it was one in the 10th century, that is the 10th century AD, I use the Christian dating when I can I give a date here. In the 10th century, uh, a great Sufi said, Today, Sufism is a name without a reality. In the beginning, it was a reality without a name. Uh, but uh, then, uh, Hujwiri in the 11th century commented on this uh, saying in the time of the companions of the prophet the name did not exist the name Sufism did not exist but the reality was in everybody now the name exists without the reality well that is uh, uh, 
theory and exaggeration but nonetheless one could say also that in fact uh, there was a name and that name was Islam that was the, the first name of Sufism at its beginning Islam was the highly rigorous path of doing one's utmost it was unalleviated by a legal minimum and uh, when we read the earliest verses of the Quran we are conscious of uh, an elite surrounding the Prophet whose lives were utterly dedicated to God and whose intensity of worship clearly went far beyond the possibility of all but a few so that when the religion began to spread uh, the revelation made uh, the demands less rigorous At the beginning, uh, we do not have exact dates, but the Prophet was in Mecca uh, for about 12 years before he went to Medina. We have the date uh, 622 is the date of the Hijra, that is when the Prophet himself went to Medina and that is the year one in the uh, Anno Hegeri, A-H, we call the Latin Anno, Anno Hegeri, the year of the Hijra, uh, is the first year of, the, of Islam, uh, 622 AD. But about 12 years before that came the first revelation of the Quran in Mecca to the Prophet. Now, in the beginning uh, of Islam, there was a certain advantage which has never existed since that time. That is, a total absence of hypocrisy. Because there was no advantage, to say the least, in being a Muslim. It was disadvantageous from a worldly point of view and in highly dangerous so that there were no uh, there, were n there was nobody who pretended to be a Muslim but then uh, 13, 12 or 13 years later when the Prophet moved to Medina and became very quickly the ruler of Medina uh, there was, there began to be a considerable worldly advantage in being a Muslim. So then the danger of, of hypocrisy began. And uh, that is inevitably what has happened uh, more and more since. Spiritual men and women gradually became more and more of a minority and uh, it is very significant that uh, the very early Me uh, a very early Meccan revelation the Surat al-Muzammal al -Muzammal, uh, meaning addressing the Prophet uh, you who are wrapped up because the prophet was although he wanted to receive revelations it was such a tremendous experience that he was frightened there's a verse of the Quran which tells us if we sent down this Quran upon a mountain it would break in pieces 
and that gives us some idea of what it must have been like uh, for the prophet to receive who was more than a mountain much much more than a mountain uh, his soul was much more more but it, nonetheless it was uh, a very awe inspiring experience to say the least and he wrapped himself he told his wife to put clothes on top of him at night sometimes he felt afraid now this revelation begins uh, arise to the prophet telling him to arise and to keep vigil all the night save a little and follow this is followed by other uh, rigorous orders but in the Medina period a final verse was added to this surah making the demands much less rigorous because the demands of Sufism which the, the, these first Muslims were clearly Sufis without the name Sufi they were bent on doing all that was physically possible. They were totally d given to God and they were capable of carrying out the instructions uh, such as uh, keep vigil all the night, save a little, half of it or more or less and so on. Whereas this final verse which was revealed in, in Medina uh, says that God does not wish to ask of man too much and do what is what is easy for you what you can do with with ease and so on uh, this final verse was added but nonetheless despite that addition of uh, the final verse in the Surah Muzammil the, the Quran continues uh, throughout its revelation to address the small group of Sufis who nonetheless uh, continue to exist uh, until the present day and there are many verses in the Quran which go over the heads of the average Muslim, of the vast majority of Muslims. What, for example, is thought by people uh, of a verse? It is not the eyesights which are blind but it is the hearts in the breasts which are blind. The average Muslim, the vast majority of Muslim, they don't know what that means. Uh, for them the heart is just the center of the uh, uh, of the human body uh, uh, towards which blood flows which keep, keep, keeps the body alive but in the Quran when in the verse like this uh, it is not the eyesights which are blind but the hearts in the breasts which are blind al it is referring to what is called in Sufism the eye of the heart that is the center not of the body but the center of the soul uh, the prophet himself uh, said that he he spoke of being awake like the other prophets uh, before him that is that his eye the, heart, uh, the eye of his heart was open 
and that is something which the eye, well, the average person doesn't, uh, doesn't the average Muslim doesn't know anything about. Now, when we read the Quran, we, we when we come to the phrase uh, in Arabic, "akthar nas," most people, that is most Muslims, so called. We know that something bad is coming. There is no mention of the word Sufi in the Quran. Of course, the name didn't exist. But when we know the nearest Quranic equivalent to Sufism is the phrase Ulul al Bab, those who have a kernel, uh, literally speaking, the kernel being the heart. It is those. Uh, it is the the kernel uh, lub which is referred to in this verse la ta'mal 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 it is not the eyesight which are blind but it is the hearts and the breasts which are blind the heart is the kernel referred to by in ulul al bab the phrase when that uh, those words come in the Quran, we know that it's going to be followed by something good. And throughout the Quran, throughout the revelation of the Quran, down to the end, there are many verses which uh, pass over the heads of the majority of Muslims and which, which are made for the Sufis, clearly themselves. Now, I will go on, uh, uh, I must, mustn't spend too long talking about this, but uh, I will just go on to say a few words about uh, Sufi doctrine <coughs> and uh, uh, I recounted in my book on uh, an Algerian sheikh, a great Al Algerian Sufi sheikh. Uh, the book itself is called A Sufi Saint of the 20th Century. He lived at the beginning of the last century, that is in the 1900s. And he would say sometimes to his disciples, uh, so I read, I never encountered him myself, but I encountered one of his uh, successors or his successor, but he, he would say sometimes to some of his disciples, I wish you had never, I sometimes wish you had never learned the words La ilaha illallah, because you don't understand the meaning. The meaning of La ilaha illallah means, because the name, the, the word ilaha includes uh, all the divine names. The word Allah includes all the divine names. Uh, la ilaha illallah means also la haqqa illallah. There is no reality but God. The Sufis say uh, with regard to their doctrine, um, they quote the saying of the Prophet of and uh, they quote his saying God was and there was nothing with him and the Sufis add in respect of their doctrine he is now even as he was they do that uh, uh, with a certain cunning they know that they are safe from persecution if they express themselves in that way because the average uh, faqih that is a representative of the Islamic doctrine will not dare to suggest that God changes that God is subject to change they say he is now even as he was that is he, he is and there is nothing with him um, the question of union, uh, 
does not exist, union with God does not exist in Sufism, despite the accusations of people uh, about that, because one plus one equals two. One plus naught equals one. And that is the doctrine of Sufism. One must become nothing in order to be uh, to be with God. And that nothingness is expressed by the word fakr, poverty. That is why Sufis among themselves they don't speak of uh, Sufis, they speak of the Fukhara. Are all the Fukhara here, for example? That is the, the poor. The spiritual poverty, Fakr, in its highest sense, means nothingness. The word Fana, extinction, is used very much in Sufism. Extinction. That means extinction of the individual soul. The soul becomes nothing in order that it may enter the divine presence, because only nothing can enter the divine presence. And this is what really distinguishes uh, the Sufis from the rest of the from the rest of the community. Of course, not every Sufi, I'm not uh, claiming that every Sufi lives up to what Sufism means. Um, and in fact, there is, there's necessarily been a degeneration in, in Sufism, as in other, uh, in, in other aspects of Islam. But there is another another aspect of Sufism about which I would like to say something before we finish. What is the time? Uh, 20 to 2. What? 20 to 2. 20 to 2, yes. Well, I've gone. No, it's okay, it's great. But you said three quarters of an hour. Take as long as you like. I will, I will go on in any case. I will just mention this point of this aspect of Sufism. Uh, as you know, the world is made in the image of God. There is a hadith, uh, it is sometimes uh, usually accepted by the Sufis as a hadith Qudsi, that is where God speaks in the first person on the tongue of the Prophet. But uh, it is recognized as a truth generally in <coughs> Islam, expressing a truth. Uh, uh, and put into the words of God, I was a hidden treasure, and I loved to be known, and so I created the world, or and sometimes it said, and so I created man, but man is a world in himself, he is the little world in Islamic, <coughs> in uh, uh, Sufi language, al kaun al-kabir is the the, the macrocosm in English, a uh, Greek word, but in English it's the macrocosm, is the outer world. The microcosm, el kaunis sarir, is the little world of man. And uh, sometimes this analogy, man, uh, all religions teach that man was created in the image of God. Uh, Judaism, Christianity and Islam, for example, are identical in that doctrine. Now, uh, sometimes there is therefore an analogy between man and God. Man, God and man made in his image. But sometimes the analogy is inverted. God is after all the first of all things. But man was created the last of all things, when everything else he was created on the on the sixth day after everything else. 
Another example of the inverse analogy is that in God the, the divine beauty is more of a secret than the divine goodness. The divine. the divine beauty is more of a secret than the divine goodness. Whereas in man, beauty is outward, goodness is inward. Now, sacred art uh, is only concerned with one thing, that is the divine beauty, which is the secret. And therefore, sacred art requires as its artists uh, those people who are innermost in the community who have uh, and who can see inwards more than other people and those are precisely the Sufis it has been calculated for example now what are the two great sacred arts of Islam one might say uh, what springs first of all to, to mind is architecture and calligraphy those are the two of the greatest sacred arts in Islam and it has been calculated that uh, nearly all the builders of mosques were Sufis and uh, it has been also calculated that 80% of the great calligraphers of the great uh, Quran calligraphers who wrote manuscripts of the Quran were Sufis that is another aspect it's the same thing in every other religion um, you always have the what are called the mystics in Christianity, most of the manuscripts, uh, most of the churches were built uh, in by people who had some kind of uh, of uh, equivalent to the Sufis. And in the Middle Ages of Christianity, most of the manuscripts, the beautiful manuscripts, were written in the monasteries and the convents of Christianity. It's the same with other religions in Buddhism, in Hinduism, and in Taoism, the Far Eastern. Now, <clears throat> I haven't time to say much more, but I would like to read you the end of, in English, an English translation of the, the wine song of Ibn al-Farid. Ibn al-Farid lived in the uh, to the end of the Middle Ages uh, in Egypt and uh, he was considered by some people to be the greatest of Arab poets and one of his poems is called Al-Khamriya it is the wine signifies uh, God the Divine Presence. Uh, of course wine is forbidden to uh, Muslims but things forbidden to Muslims are not at the same level. Uh, we are not promised the meat of pigs in paradise which is forbidden. We are promised wine in paradise and uh, that's the difference between the two. <laughs> And uh, uh, this is what uh, Ibn al-Farid, how he ends his poem. The tavern where the wine is to be found means the Zawiyah, that is the place where the Sufis gathered together, because Ibn al-Farid was a great Sufi. His tomb is outside Cairo near the eastern desert 
and it is considered as one of the seven holiest places in Egypt uh, to be visited um, the tomb of Ibn al-Farid I will just read you these lines seek it then in the tavern this is the wine bid it unveil that is let the cobwebs be taken off the, the vessel which holds the wine bid it unveil to strains of music they offset its worth for wine and care dwelt never in one place even as woe with music cannot dwell be drunk one hour with it and thou shalt see time's whole age as thy slave at thy command. He hath not lived here who hath sober lived, and he who dieth not drunk hath missed the mark. With tears then let him mourn himself, whose life hath passed, and he no share of it have had well let, let, let me end here my talk because there is no more time <laughs>